really get going. All right, hold on one sec. Okay. Hey, 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 everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you are doing well. And you are here watching an exclusive interview on YouTube, our Fantano channel. Appreciate you coming through. We're streaming this live on Twitch at the moment. Shout out to the chat. Shout out to everybody here. Uh, look, we've been doing these interviews on Twitch for a little under a year now. And over the course of that year, we've had some great guests, a few legends over the course of those interviews every week. Uh, and we're adding another one to that belt today. Uh, we have one of the most well-known, influential, and groundbreaking producers, composers in the hip-hop genre and beyond with us today. In for a lengthy conversation, we have Mr. Mike Dean. How you doing, man? What's up? How you doing, man? Good. Good to meet you. Thank you very much for coming through. Appreciate it. I had to be on the needle drop, you know. I I was wondering if you'd come through, you know, not not just because of you know just like recent interactions, but we we had beef a while back, like a like a, a while ago, like a, like a, a few heated Twitter Twitter interactions. I guess so. Yeah. Whatever, it's just it's all fun. Yeah. It's water under the bridge at this point. But um, exactly, I mean. <laughs> but uh, uh, look, um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, you know, begin with here is that. Uh, we're just crossing over the threshold um, of a new decade. Uh, you know, there's no sign of you creatively stopping at this point. And a lot of the people who are in my audience who are aware of what you do, uh, a lot of their framework for what is the Mike Dean sound, the Mike Dean style, um, is really based off of a handful of relatively recent records. But, you know, you've been doing your thing since the 80s, professionally to some degree. And I yep. wanted to, you know, respect, retrospectively go back a little with you and try to at least like lay down a reminder, a groundwork, you know, some context for everybody to sort of understand what made you the producer and composer that you are today. So, you know, if, if you could in sort of like a bit of a story time style. Um, would you be able to take us back to Texas, 80s, rap a lot? You're a budding musician and you're just starting to break into the industry. Uh, you know, what were those early connections for you and what were those talents you were bringing to the table that made you an asset to artists like Ghetto Boys and UGK as you were, you know, starting to get, uh, you know, land production credits? I mean, in the 80s, I guess, like 1983. I graduated high school, um, and I was like, let's see, to go all the way back, I was like hanging out with Mike Hampton and like Eddie Hazel from Parliament Funkadelic, you know, George Clinton's, all these side musicians. I used to jam with them like in parks in Houston and in projects, and you know. Um, so I had that job offer when I graduated high school. They're like, yeah, you, Bernie Wells leaving the group to go produce the Talking Heads, you can come take his place. I had the choice to do that or else to go play with this new Spanish artist named Selena, you know, that, you know, I'd met her, her father through a music store owner in Texas in a little small town where we grew, lived at. Yeah. We're like in a Dow chemical town called Angleton and Lake Jackson, you know, little shit towns in Texas. Um, not shit towns, but, um, yeah. And I, I mean, I chose to go play with Selena cause it, it was just you know, a few hundred more dollars a week and I'd just gotten married and, you know, I wanted to go out and make some fucking money. And <laughs> yeah, basically I did that for, you know, a few years, played all different kinds of Tejano bands, you know, like I played with La Mafia, you know, produced them some, a group of Maz, I played with them on the road for like a year and a half, which was cool because when I quit Selena's band, her dad was like, you'll never work in the Spanish music, you know, and I was like, Okay, you're gonna open up for me when I go play for this other band, and they opened up for us for like years. <laughs> um, he pissed me off, um, and I don't know. Shit, just kind of like after that, I I quit playing in bands because it's always like one person that fucks shit up. You know, it's always like just takes one person to ruin a band. You know, so I started more wanting to promote Mike Dean as a name and. I got a job in an Italian restaurant playing the piano, you know, and played the piano at this Italian restaurant for like two and a half years. You know, and while I did that, I worked on rap beats. And also I was worked, you know, deep into car stereo, which got me into sound. 
I don't know, and that just kind of, after a few years of producing rap groups in Houston, random, you know, independent shit, uh, rap a lot, you know, caught their eye, and Jay Prince gave me a job. Started working with Bushwick Bill, it was my first project. You know, it's a good shit test. If you can do a Bushwick Bill project, you can fucking, you can make it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, for, for that Bushwick Bill project, like, I mean, knowing his style, what was the challenge there for you to make it like as grimy and as raw as possible? Yeah, I mean, I was working with um, Beto One, the producer, and um, and uh, Gangster Nip was writing a lot of the lyrics. Gangster Nip and who else? Willie D hmm. wrote all of Bushwick's lyrics. Um, so I was kind of like just starting out. You know, I was engineering. Like my job was just to make shit sound muddy as we called it you know mm -hmm. so people used to call it music muddy they used to insult me but you know it's it because we had so much bass that the, you couldn't hear the highs you know mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, we didn't know, I didn't know how to mix back then and we were just like doing our best you know what i mean and you know beyond uh, uh bushwick and ghetto boys and and even you know uh, some of the scarface projects that you've been on um you know, Southern hip hop around that time hadn't quite developed the sound that people would know it for in the mid to late nineties and, and even the two thousands. Um, you know, what for you as somebody who was obviously there personally and involved in some of that evolution and progression were some of the sonic or artistic breaking points that would kind of lead to the South having a distinctly different sound from the East coast and the West coast. Like what made that, you mean? Yeah, 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 essentially, or, yeah. I mean, we were heavily influenced by the East Coast, yeah. you know, and the West, I guess, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> like, you can definitely see or hear all the, the East Coast t types of beats and breaks and shit, you know, but we slowed them down, like, from, like, 95 to, like, 80, 70 BPM, you know to make the, the more stuff that influenced, you know, DJ Screw to do the Chopped and Screwed later, mm -hmm. all of our slowed down music. Plus we were all, you know, a lot of us were on codeine and smoked a lot of weed, you know, and you just wanted to just chill out. You didn't want to fucking make fucking, you know, like DOS effects music and like, you know, you know, but anyway, you know, in the West Coast influence, you know, like Dr. Dre influenced us, like not really Dre, but more, NWA, you know, early Ice Cube, you know, like we were all connected, you know, through Jay Prince and, you know, Suge Knight and Dre, they all knew each other, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, so Jay so, ended up essentially being that connection that would eventually lead you to working like with Death Row and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It was never worked with Death Row, but with Dog Pound, I did a lot of stuff. Oh, got it, got it, got it. But you were connected to that scene closely enough to, from what I understand, get a hold of like some unreleased stuff as well? Yeah, that was, that was with Daz Dillinger, you know, mm -hmm. Daz from the Dog Pound. We, in like, the, I guess 2000, you know, me and Daz got to be really close. You know, we knew each other from back whenever the, like, Dog Pound used, or Snoop used to come do features with Scarface and they'd all come around. Mm -hmm. And we used to actually, like, they used to stay at my, we had a studio apartment in, in like, West L.A. And they used to all just, like, stay at my apartment. We'd all just crash on the couch and work on music for weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. Two tons of drug, stay up for weeks. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's kind of the connection there, you know, to the Got it. Dog Pound. And, you know, if, if you could also kind of go into uh, moving on from there, the art, the artistic transitions that you were beginning to make in the 2000s as, uh, you know, the South continued to define itself sonically and artistically. And then also beyond that, you began to work with artists like Kanye West. Um, you know, would you be able to go into a little bit of what exactly made that meeting happen you know, initially? That was um, that was all through Scarface, really. I mean, not through but through his music mm. I, I mixed the um guess who's back um and you know the other songs that kanye produced on the fix you know scarface the fix album and that caught kanye's ear he asked this guy you know hip you know hip-hop since 1978 hip-hop and plain pat 
who I knew, you know, from back, you know, when Jay-Z used to come around Scarface and shit. Um, they made that connection. And, you know, Connie was like, whoever did that song, I want them to mix my, my mixtape. And then they brought me, Connie came to my house the first time in Texas. He flew down for a day. Um, so he couldn't be out of the city for too long. He was like, you know, a real, a real diva even back then. Um, and he, um, he came down, I think we did, we started the mix on Keep the Receipt and um, Two Words. I mastered, I think, Through the Wire on the first trip. Mm-hmm. And just after that, like, he just, he would come down to see me a day or two every week, you know, and get work done. And kind of helped define his sound, you know, his sonically, you know, being just like on another level from everybody else. Mm-hmm. Try to kind of put my southern spin on the new york shit you know Hmm. and uh you know to sort of talk about the progression of that southern sound because it's really been sort of like a dominant force especially over the past decade with you know the rise and prominence of trap music and the infusion of that into almost everything from pop to electronic music um you know do, do you feel like that sound the spirit of it is sort of like being represented accurately through a lot of these new embodiments that are out there I think so. You know, it's, I'm not mad at it. It's like, like being copied is like the best flattery, you know, like they say. Mm-hmm. Is the best flattery, you know? So as long as they don't, I don't appreciate them calling um, slowed and reverb, slowed and reverb. I think that's stupid as fuck. You know, fuck all those slow and reverb people, you know. Uh, it's shot good, you know. Yeah. With some reverb. <laughs> What's, what's even more what's even more aggravating have you have you seen the 8d audio have you seen the 8d audio stuff on youtube i got into it a little bit whenever they had whenever the whole slowed and reverb thing came uh, up i looked that and i just kind of forgot about it what is it again oh it's it's literally just like uh almost like the same mix of anything that you've already heard but with a bunch of reverb thrown on it and all they're doing is just panning it from left to right slowly it's it's awful it's the worst thing it's it's the perfect way to ruin a song fucking moron <laughs> <laughs> so you know with, with the evolution of this style and in the way that it's changed today and you know specifically talking about artists that you've worked with who are in that wave like travis and like trippy red um you know while a lot of people still refer to it these days as trap music um you know i feel like it's taken on a significantly different tone than like you know be it a waka or a jeezy or a ti or, or whoever you could reference from back in the day because this new wave of it is so much more psychedelic especially in the case of travis um you know i mean would, would you be able to speak to i guess sort of those trippier more i guess wavier elements of you know the genres kind of taken on as of late and the artists who are kind of spearheading that that you've worked with I mean, Travis, um, the Migos, like Ray Stroman, like all those guys, they kind of define the trippy, you know, the trippier version of trap music, I think you'd call it. Mm. It's a little slower than trap, maybe a little bit more, more synths, more wobbly sounds, you know, the wobbling where it sounds like a broken record on the, you know, the loops and shit. Mm. You know, and then I try to take it to a whole another level on my shit with the, you know, the crazy synth shit, and you know, that's kind of been a, a plan of mine to, you know, the, over the years. To, every year I turn the synths up a little bit louder, you know, to where people get used to them. Then I can start dropping my 420 and 422 albums and shit like that, you know, get people where they, you know, kind of accept the sound, you know, like the end of the Scotch or the end of Highest in the Room. Mm-hmm. You know, that's basically what I do on my albums, you know? Yeah. Same shit. Do you want to detour for a second and talk about those projects since you just kind of released them? Yeah. Um, I mean, 420 was my first in quarantine album, I guess. You know, it was just me and my girlfriend, Louise, we were just in the house on lockdown. I think the first day that they did the safe, at, they called it safe at home, you know, from governor out here. Mm-hmm. Um, I just started doing live streams on Instagram and shit. Um, after about 10 or 12 live streams, I was like, man, I got a lot of good music recorded. I should just, you know, mix an hour and a half of this shit and put it out as an album. And it's basically how the 420 album came about. Mm. You know, and, um, 
Same thing with the um, 422. I, I've been watching the NFT stuff, you know, coming around since you know, like December, you know, I started getting more mainstream, more popular. Mm. Um, and once I figured out what the, an NFT was, I, I knew I wanted to do one. Mm. I went on the you know went on the search to find the perfect artist and a friend of mine introduced me to Shepherd Fairy, hmm. and we hit it off well. You know we have the same kind of values. We're kind of the same age. Hmm. And we um, and at the point that we agreed to do an NFT drop, you know, with original music, that's when I decided I was going to do the 422 album. Hmm. So about a month before the album came out, hmm. you know, I just I made everything like a month after that. You know, just live streams and shit. Hmm. We have our auction actually coming up on the twenty seventh. It's gonna be cool. Well, we're gonna have like mm -hmm. interior auction, you know, like you know DJ Blau, mm -hmm. the auction, here. something similar to that with the same people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, those were, you know, I guess the conditions that these projects, specifically four twenty, was created under. Um, but I guess what led you to. I, I guess sort of the creative concept of it, because obviously the project is so massive and lengthy and given what people know of kind of the music you've been involved in in the past, I, I think a lot of fans wouldn't necessarily expected like this progressive synth, like space ambient record where it's just like, you know, just walls of synthesizers. I mean, yeah. are there specific artists that you're a fan of that you kind of pull inspiration from when it comes to those kind of styles or were you just like kind of vibing the whole thing out? I'm just vibing the whole thing out. I mean, you know, all the old synth legends, you know, fucking um, Vangelis, like, yeah, Emerson, like, <clears throat> um, just all of them, Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, you know, trying to pay homage to a little bit, little bit of to all of them. You, know, you see, I got fucking keyboards for days. You do. <laughs> I'm always hustling for more. You know, I mean, I got like. I got more than this in storage, you know what I mean? In Texas, I got a, two storage rooms full of keyboards and old drum machines and shit, you know? Well, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean... But yeah, I mean, I kind of made them just to get out some creativity, of, you know, of, of my own in the world so people could see where I'm coming from, kind of. Mm -hmm. And to, like, kind of bait for people to get me to start scoring movies, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> You know, like, oh, you should score a movie. You know? mm -hmm. I, I wanted to uh, to ask you this. But I, I wrote this down, but now that you kind of like, you know, mention all the keyboards and everything, it makes me want to uh, dive into it now. But, um, it, you know, over the course of, I guess, the evolution of music and specifically hip hop production over the years, um, you know, you you strike me as very much kind of a hardware sort of guy. But uh, do you feel like anything's been sort of lost or enhanced over the process of, I guess, software becoming like more of a major factor in basically the production of, of everything? I mean, I'm still really deep, deep in software, too. You yeah. know, I just I just like tactical sense, being able to grab knobs and, you know, yeah, not have a mouse every time I want to do something. I mean, I'd say like when I work on an album, you know, for artists, I would say, what do you think, guys, like half of my shit is VSTs, probably you know like half the sense I do are probably you know plugins you know mm. just because I want to sit here in my chair and on this one keyboard and just go blah, 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 and fuck with the mouse and not have to get up you know, mm. you know sometimes I'll use this keyboard this little keyboard over here just to control all the shit through MIDI you know where I don't have to get up you know? mm -hmm. and then I ask Sean just like hey hit the filter over there. You know? <laughs> So, the, so there's help around just to just to get all the physical stuff, knobs turned, that sort of thing. Yeah, I got a whole crew. I mean, you know, got it. Sean, Tommy are always here at the house working. You know, hmm. uh, I have a interesting question over here um, from chat. Uh, Amar Ali seventeen wants to know, uh, and and maybe this is sort of you know just more of the school that you come from, but. Uh, uh, he wants to know, why don't you have a producer tag? And obviously you don't. I guess this would maybe be a, a space for you to sort of like talk about what you think about kind of the culture of producer tags, just sort of in general. We have a producer tag. Oh, okay. I just don't put it on everything, you know? Okay. Like, what songs have I put tags on? Like, fucking, doesn't Timmy Turner have a tag on it? One of the Nico 
Some of the Migos shit has tags like the song me and Sean did for Two Chains. Well, then, then, then I guess the question is like, is there a reason why creatively you're not spamming it as much as like, let's say Pierre Bourne and sort of like it pops up eight times in a track or something? Is there sort of like a philosophy to like when you apply it, when you don't? I just feel like somebody's album isn't really a a billboard for you. Mm. You know what I mean, but I mean, you know, respect to whoever does tags. You know, what I mean, like, you know, Metro Boomin tag really helped him become a household name. You know, he's killing it. Mm. You can't really hate on tag. You know, it's, I remember like back in the day, we used to really hate like we were doing like UGK albums or working on Pimp C. They'd be like, man, Pimp C, be like, take those tags out. I ain't advertising for them. You know. <laughs> Well, yeah, that that does lead me to another question I wanted to ask, though, because, um, you know, to your point, like you said, uh, another person's track isn't necessarily a billboard for you. But um, whether you're working with a Travis or a Kanye or any number of different artists, uh, a lot of the time, especially when it comes to the types of keyboards you apply to a track or guitar that you apply to a track, you do have a very like specific sound and style that like people recognize and, you know, people people draw it to you you know what i mean so when you're in the studio working with you know whoever like you know where's sort of that balance where you want to serve the song but you sort of put your own fingerprint on it too i mean that's that's my tag basically that's what's about having a sound that's so distinct that people can like when you come on a track oh that's mike dean on the synth you know like you know there's people and people do knock off innings which you can always tell when it's not me at least I can. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> I definitely did do that track. I would I'm doing songs, I don't remember it, and then I hear it. I'm like, "Well, that's, that's cool. Who did that?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's you." You know, um, that happens a lot of time when my when my girl has like music on. What do you call it? Right. Random shuffle. Hmm. You know, and one of my songs will come on and I'll be like, what's that? And it's like, oh, it's one of my four songs. Anyway, I got way off track there. No, that's fine. I, I think the, I think we're, you know, exactly where we want to be topically. Um, going back to the Texas scene, you know, being somebody who came out of that, what do you think about, you know, artists who are representing, I guess, kind of the new wave of the scene right now? You know, specifically people like Megan The Stallion. You know, do you feel like Texas is still like, putting its best to you know foot forward artistically right now as far as hip-hop goes i love megan like you know i mix all of her stuff now like yeah put a song out without like a feature even without me mixing her voice you know it's kind of cool um i I love how she's rapping like she's like super old school houston sounding to me you know like she's like a combination of houston and like nwa Hmm. (laughs) you know it's like her flow styles to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously with like, you know, Girls in the Hood, for example, like there's a really clear like attempting to reference that. Well, yeah, for sure. Not attempting. That's like yeah. A... yeah, actually referencing it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's great. Like Travis is very Houston now. Like mm. um, at first he wasn't that much, you know, now he's like more Houston than ever, you know. Mm. At first, he was more Travis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you about uh, some of the art or other artists that you've been working with as of late, because uh, you know one thing that I think uh, you're known for, or you should be known for, is you're you're always working with new talent, and you always sort of seem to be scouting for somebody who's like about to break ground or you know sort of like uh, do something brand new. Um, you know, who are some of the young up and comers that you're kind of like watching at the moment and doing things for that you think will have a, uh, you know, potential over the next like two to three years? I mean, I've been doing a lot of work with Ian Dior. Mm-hmm. We've done like 10 songs probably, you know, mm-hmm. I'm working on his album pretty heavy. Um, did the new single that just came out with KBZ and, um, uh, Omer. Um, I mean, him, I've been working with actually Noah Cyrus, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Fuck with her. She's a really great singer. Um, 
then lately I've been working with more eclectic artists, you know, like, like, um, right now I've been with Christine and the Queens. Okay. She's, she's been over every other day. Like we're working for a month. Um, who else? Lana Del Rey. We're working on her stuff. Yeah. How's, uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about that specifically. Uh, would you be able to give an idea as to how some of that is turning out? This is cool. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't get into the details because it's not done yet. We don't know what it's, you know, I don't want to jinx it, you know, talking about it too much. Well, she, I know, you know she has that uh, next record that's dropping very soon this year. It, the work that you're doing with her, is it specifically for that record or is it for an even further down the road project? It's for that record. Okay. Then, you know, we're pulling stuff for future projects. Like, we're, you know, I'm, I'm planning on working with her a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um. Yeah. How exactly did that connection happen? And when it did, how familiar were you with uh, Lana's back catalog? Oh, very, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, my friends produce all of her stuff, you know, a lot of her stuff. So, mm -hmm. Will Hayden and Jeff Basker and, you know, all those guys. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess when approaching it, I mean, not to spoil too much, I guess, um, when approaching a project like hers is, you know, it's sort of your goal to continue to deliver those aesthetics that fans are, you know, sort of familiar with, whether it be the piano, the strings, you know, sort of like that almost like orchestral elegance, or are you bringing like synths to the table and, and everything and kind of changing it up a, a little bit instrumentally? Kind of a mesh of both, I think, mm -hmm. you know, you gotta stay true to the original, but you can definitely do your twist on it, you know? Okay. And um, uh, from what I understand, have, have there been any crossovers recently with um, Rosalia with uh, with what you've been doing? Or did I misread that? What do you mean crossover? Like, have, have you been working with, with, uh, with her on music or working on her music at all? Last year a little bit. Um, yeah. I need to actually maybe call her and see what's going on. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess I wanted yeah. to uh, to sort of ask a bit of a full circle question, like considering how one of your first big breaks into the industry was with, you know, Selena and, you know, playing with that band uh, to sort of see an artist like Rosalia bring like that Latin music flavor almost to a new level of, you know, bring it to, a, you know, another resurgence or be a part of that resurgence. I mean, does that say anything to you about kind of like where things are musically for that genre, that style or where things are culturally at the moment? I think it's really good. I mean, I've got a couple of, you know, Latino artists I'm working with, mm. like, you know, Milkman, you heard of him? Mm -mm. He's a producer. He's producer turning artist. He produced Jay Balvin and, you know, all those guys. Okay. Working on his stuff. Rosalia, I mean, she's she's really fucking good. Like, a classically trained mariachi singer, you know, and fucking really crazy. Mm. Um, I'm also getting some questions here from chat, and I have been getting questions all day about uh, I, I, a lot of Kanye stuff. I, I think we can maybe dive into that for a minute, um, specifically to get this out of the way. Is is Donda still coming out? Is that still a thing? Like we, we know there have been so many Kanye projects in the past that were kind of an idea, but then never really ended up kind of seeing the light of day. But considering that you had involvement with that project, is that still like on the table? Is that is does that does that thing still have a pulse? I mean, is is good ass job coming out? I mean, <laughs> it's just gonna evolve into something else you know what i mean i, mean, I don't know i haven't seen him in a minute you know so i don't know where his head's at hmm. he's gonna keep making the christian albums or if he's gonna you know go back to the old kanye <laughs> or you know you know whatever well considering that you know you sort of put it that way um as somebody who's you know worked on and off with him closely in a number in a number of different capacities uh do you share i guess sort of like the confusion or concern about like where he seems to be kind of, or what he seems to be going through right now, artistically and personally. Uh, I mean, you know, not to get too much into the personal stuff, but you know, obviously a record like Jesus is King is like nothing else. He's, you know, released in further into his back catalog, you know, not only in terms of like the topic, but you know, just like the form and flow of the record too. Like, is there kind of a, uh, kind of a chaos that I think is will will pass at some point, or is this just kind of the new normal? I don't know. Yeah, you don't know. I mean, it's up to him and you know 
how the simulation moves it. <laughs> you know, as he says, you know, it's like, I mean, Jesus is King was, you know, departure from Connie's regular shit, but he's, it's a really good album, you know, it's still as good as, you know, it wasn't recorded. It's not the best recorded album, you know, like, but it's, you know, I make, you know, I mix the shit out of it. You know, we, we actually won a Grammy for it, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So it shows that he's still connecting, you know, somehow, even with his, you know, left field music that he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I guess to get off this topic with, you know, a final question on it, is is, is there anything that you want to like tear, tear me a new asshole for, like in terms of anything that I've said in regards to those projects or any other project? <laughs> You probably made Kanye stop making music when you gave him that fucking six for Dark Twisted Fantasy. But mean, he kept making music, though. I mean, we were all like, man, Anthony doesn't fuck with us. <laughs> that's, like, we're done. That's such a lie. I was totally irrelevant at that point. There was no way that that review convinced anybody. <laughs> I, I I didn't even have like a, a 20,000 subscribers at that point. I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, didn't even know you did I didn't even know you did that rating until people's kept tweeting me to ask him about the rating so why did you give it a six out of ten tell me uh there are just specific tracks i'm not crazy about um uh, but i loved everything that you did on it okay that's a good good catch <laughs> <laughs> you know you know you just you just being the devil in a new dress i mean mm -hmm. in the middle mm -hmm. like who can't love fucking rizzo going fucking ridiculous you know, you know, like, you know like, like I guess we could hash it out over this. The the track that really like gets in my craw. Yeah. If if I had to pick out one track that really gets in my craw on the record, it's it's probably "Hell of a Life." It's probably that track. Yeah, it's it's pro it's probably that track. That's all me and Kanye. Too, I, I know, you know, I know. I'm just not crazy about it. I'm, I just don't care for the groove on it. And is the 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 Black Sabbath interpolation on there is is that's purposeful, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I just thought that was like the auto tune on his voice on that one. I was not crazy about it. Afterthought, you know, what I mean, that was like the last thing we put in. We weren't even going to put a hook. Uh -huh. It was just, just you know, and back to the raps. Mm -hmm. But you know. yeah, that's that that's the one that's really like the speed bump for me on the record. But you know, like again, everything else that you're doing on there, uh, um, perfect. That, that's like the, that, that's like the. Um, Drunken hot girls of graduation, right? Okay, I, I guess you could say that. <laughs> I'm dark twisted. <laughs> Not like hot girls, but people always hated on it. You know, mm. you know, uh, I I love that you know that that you're self aware about you know your stuff and the reception of it. But uh, you know, uh, on the flip side of that, what do you feel like is a beat or a production that you've done over the years that is uh, consistently overlooked? And, and not appreciated enough. Hmm. Besides drunken hot girls, obviously. Maybe stuff on Jesus, you know. Like I'm in it, like you know, like that's my favorite album, basically. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because of different, you know, like so left field. Pe people in chat know that it's. You know, not one of my favorite Kanye records, but I will say every year I feel like I hear more records that sound like that record. Do you feel like that's the case? Yeah, like we influenced a lot of shit. Like between that and um, 808s and Heartbreaks, which I didn't, you know, I didn't do production on, but still that those two records influenced like a lot of shit. I mean, you listen to artists from like Scandinavia and, you know, they had the, the drummers go, boop. you know, they have the little snare drums and shit, you know, they're like toms up high. And mm. It really did influence a lot to me. Yeah, I mean, there are even some, I think, like some production aesthetics on Billie Eilish's debut record that remind me of Yeezus. I mean, she she's said as much, you know, in sort of like playlisting tracks from that record that she enjoys. Yeah, her, her brother definitely like listened to that album a few times, you know. Mm -hmm. The distorted 808s and shit like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, considering you've also worked with him in the past, is is there any idea or sort of news as to like when there may be some new Frank Ocean as well, or is or is he just sort of like off the radar as well? I don't know. Like we were working on some stuff, you know, after Astroworld came out, and then 
I mean, he's just, he takes his time. He does what he, you know, and I think his brother passing away probably really affected his, you know, creativity. Sure. Hopefully, hopefully he comes out with some shit soon, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I know Travis is set to drop this year. Are, are you, you've been involved with that project as well, I'm assuming, or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And is that sort of, I mean, how is that shaping up currently? Is that sort of like in the ballpark of Astro World and beyond? Is it kind of, you know, deepening that kind of psychedelic lore that the trap sound has kind of taken on thanks to uh, the, his popularity? I can't really speak on that one at all. It's that top like, secret? Uh, yeah, it's like, no, it's, it might be a country album for all you know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I guess since you're dabbling in space ambient progressive synth, I mean, that's that could be the case. Uh, uh, featuring Brad Paisley, you know. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, listen, let me know what you uh, uh, sort of feel personally, what kind of keeps you... Uh, motivated and, and sort of prolific at this point in your career because you know a lot of people have sort of done it as uh, long as you have and uh, you know some who are still around are kind of like I, I guess kind of stuck into a certain sound or style that they kind of forged way back in the day but you you're, you've progressed to the point where even you're involving yourself in these emo trap records you know you're even talking about Ian Dior earlier um, you know to what do you attribute kind of this uh I guess mindset where you're just consistently able to embrace whatever kind of is coming around the bend and, and just kind of be on top of that. Because I, I know in your own personal life, you've probably experienced people your own age who have kind of tuned out. I know I have, you know, and, and I'm just in my thirties, you know, I, I run into people who are just like, <coughs> I, I don't even know who the hell any of these bands are anymore who you're talking about, but you know, you're still doing your thing and, and working with some of the most young and relevant people out there who are just uh, breaking ground. Yeah. I mean, I just try to stay fucking, stay with the youth. You know what I mean? Mm. The youth will save the world. I I, I, like, I agree with that philosophy. I agree with that philosophy. Um, you get stuck in your ways. You're fucking like if you don't learn something new and do something new every day, you're kind of fucked. You know, mm. like like the guys that are you know still making beats that like they made in the nineties. Like like nobody cares except for people their age, and they're not buying records. You know. Mm not much you know they're not they're not streaming something 24 hours a day you know i don't think I mean, it's, you just can't be stuck in your ways you know mm. no but but again as you were kind of like you know putting that in a nutshell um i i have to hardcore agree with that and sort of say just like how rare it is to come across somebody who uh it, it's just kind of their mindset that like it, no matter what it is the best and most refreshing ideas and whatever is going on in art is going to come from young people. Um, yeah. And, you know, music and specifically hip hop culture for a long time has also been sort of a youth culture and uh, sort of continuing to stay in tune with that, I imagine is just important. I mean, you know, if, if, if you want to actually, you know, be at the forefront of it. You learn that from Kanye kind of too, you know, mm. like years, like Kanye would always have his ear to what ear on fucking salad cloud. You know what I mean? Like mm. he was, like we were on um, Tower of the Creator, you know, those guys, Odd Future, we were on that shit way before, you know, popular, like, like Keith, Keith, you know what I mean? Like, it's good to know about shit, you know, before it pops, you know, that way you can, you know, just help it along also, you know, like, you know, like we did the Don't Like remix, you know, it's good to do that shit, you know? Mm -hmm. You mean just like, you know, just kind of a straightforward banger and whatever is yeah. just kind of like bubbling up from the underground. Yeah. You know, considering, um, you know, you're from a school back in the day where everything was, as far as music goes, very regional. There was a very clear separation between what was mainstream, what was underground and yeah. whatever was going on musically came through certain avenues. Um, some of which you really had to like kind of dig to find something good. But nowadays, you know, as you just kind of reference SoundCloud, numerous streaming platforms out there, it's almost like there is this extreme ease to be able to get access to anything. And, you know, do, do you, hmm? yeah. 
yeah, the barrier of entry is way different than it used to be. Yeah. You know, you know do, do you feel like the that change, the existence of that, does that like eliminate an underground effectively? And if it's still there, like where exactly is it physically or conceptually now that everything is just sort of, again, accessible through a search bar? The underground is still people who don't care about <clears throat> being popular and selling music, you know. But that kind of gets cliche, I guess. It's kind of like Nirvana, you know, all those guys that didn't want to be famous but made cool music, underground music. Um, I don't know, I mean, back in the day, we had to, to get your music out or to meet anybody, you had to go to conventions, you know, like, like they'd have rap conventions where you'd go and you would hang out with, you might see Stevie Wonder's producer and run up to him and give him a cassette and give him your number and then maybe they'll call you back, you know, or, like I used, like I remember the first people I met was like the guys from like Two Shorts producers, you know, like mm. Aunt Banks and those guys. You know, and I, I was so broke, I used to call them Collect and be like, "Yo, what's going on? What do you got for me?" You know, like do people here remember calling Collect? You remember that? <laughs> no, no one here remembers calling Collect. Don't 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 worry about anybody remember calling remembering calling Collect. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, you would call somebody instead of look the, the, you, there there are people no. there are people watching right now who their only reference to a beeper is from a rap song so just like don't 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 even worry about calling collect so there there's <laughs> <laughs> the calling collect is might as well be a fucking rotary phone like when somebody calls you from jail yeah okay yeah. well people people are familiar with that but be four dollars an hour you want to pay for the charges yeah. You know? I used to call people and be like, yo, do you want to hear my demo? <laughs> hear my demo and then what, play through the phone? Or just like, you know, shoot me an address? <laughs> no, give me an address, but you're going to pay for the call. Got it. You know. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's it's really, I don't know. I, it, you're obviously in a position where you no longer need to sort of hustle in that way. But, you know, if... If you were a young artist now, would you at least be, I don't know, encouraged by the fact that maybe whoever you're trying to reach out to is on the other end of like a Twitter DM or, you know, something like that? Or DM, no, that's how I made the connection with um, with um, Christine and the Queen. Oh, okay. Put on Instagram DM, yo, you want to work? And she's like, yeah, mm -hmm. we're working. You know, I do that a lot, you know. Oh, okay. I reach out to people, you know, like, since we're doing the, the crypto stuff, the NFT stuff, you know, I've been reaching out to a lot of the crypto wells, you know, instant message and, you know, getting them involved, you know, involved or interested in my project. Okay. So, so generally that's good to know. I mean, anybody who's watching should know that if you're out there putting out good work, you're dropping tracks, you're dropping projects, you're dropping music videos, and it's turning out great. Mike Dean may slide into your DMs on Instagram or on Twitter or somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, listen, is, is there anything that I guess, uh, over the years that, um, as a creator that you feel like has kind of changed for the better or the worse in terms of like the way the internet has kind of, you know, equalized the playing field in terms of like getting opinions out there, um, you know, people being able to effectively throw in front of your face, maybe for like the 500th time that they don't think drunken hot girls is that good. Um, you know, the, the, the creation of people like me, you know, it's, is, is, is it terrible that essentially I'm able to kind of get online and anybody else's and just be able to be like, uh, eh, you know, this new project, I, I don't think it's that great. You know, sh should we have essentially left it to the rolling stones of the world to kind of handle this thing? No, cause it's more real and it's a bunch of different people doing it. You know what I mean? You can just average out what you hear, but if it's just one person writing for a magazine, of course they could be biased. They could be paid by a label to say something good you know hmm. you never know but when it's like randoms on the internet and not that you're a random but you know what i mean I, I'm, I'm as i'm as random as they get when you are you're a random you know you're just some dude saying your opinion you know and people were interested enough to listen yeah you know? mm -hmm. but uh but uh well I'm, I'm glad that you're down for the democratization of uh of of all of that um Democratization of art, of decentralization of money, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Do you feel like, though, that's sort of like, I guess, uh, 
spread out the pot so far as far as artists go um, that a lot of people are kind of getting, you know, the short end of the stick, at least on the streaming side. Uh, you know, do you, do you feel like uh, streaming platforms have essentially kind of created maybe a middleman that wasn't there when it comes to artists being able to make money off the music they're putting out there? I think that's overhyped hmm. for myself. I mean, it's like streaming, especially the last few years, has been getting better. You know what I mean? Like, I think I make more publishing than I used to, you know? Like, things, like over the years, like there's the Music Modernization Act, People like Mark, you know, one of the publishing, you know, big business guys, they're all pushing new laws and new, you know, s stuff in Congress to, to make people get paid better. So hmm. you know, over the next 10 years, it's like a sunrise deal where the streaming will start paying a lot better. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, to sort of touch down on the crypto thing that you've mentioned a few times over the course of the interview, have, have you made mention of, uh, of this, uh, uh, at all, sort of like on Twitter or anything like that? Yeah, I tweet here and there about it. Me and Ben Baller joke about stuff, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, both I, I guess I'm curious. I mean, I've mentioned it a few times and have gotten like massive pushback for it. Like, you know, uh, over the course of your mentions of it, have, have you gotten much, if any, hate over it? I mean, some people hate about the energy consumption, and, you know, <clears throat> carbon footprint of crypto. But, I mean, what's the carbon footprint of ink and money? It's it's all, everything has a carbon footprint. And and they're working on ways to make the crypto be a lot more energy efficient so it doesn't, so it doesn't account for a large percentage of greenhouse gases and shit like that. And, like, I don't know, it's, it's just a new Wild West, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's cool. Like, I mean, I... Some kid, some kid put, how would he put 500 on Dogecoin? made a million bucks like in a year you know i mean personally i can't say i really mind the technology or what it's attempting to do i guess uh i guess it's my philosophy that it's hard enough for artists out there to make a buck generally if some random can make thousands or whatever millions of dollars off some random nft or whatever i mean all the more power to them i guess um, and, and, yeah. and I guess it's not necessarily crypto's fault for me, per, you know, from my point of view, that it was born into a painfully inefficient sort of energy grid. You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, do you ever think about how much energy it takes for Netflix or Hulu? Sure. Why I, mean, it's like, I, I, I think about that. But like primarily, I think, you know, the concern should be or could be maybe more on the fact that like we burn the energy that we do and we generate the energy that we do because you have people from coal and people from oil and people from gas constantly lobbying Congress because our politics is completely greased by legalized, like legalized bribes. Um, you know, if it weren't for the fact that green energy is now just starting to get kind of like a bit of a foothold in that, uh, you wouldn't be having all these incentives to do solar panels and all this other shit. So, you yeah. know, un unfortunately, I think that, uh, you know, as far as like the kind of energy that we could be generating, we're just really behind on it. And it's not necessarily on account of crypto that that is the case. It's, you know, really because no. of fossil fuel companies. Because of Donald Trump and fucking all these dickhead Republicans fucking holding on to oil, you know. Mm -hmm. you know? That and, just, you know, any corporate yeah. Democrats out there, too. But, uh, you know, our, our addiction to a war in the Middle East, it's uh, it's it's all a clusterfuck. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I'm not even going to comment on anything else about the Middle East. It's fucked right now. Yeah, it's a it's it's a mess. Um, all right, so uh, uh, I could ask you a million more questions about other projects and other artists that you're involved with right now, but um, in line with the 420 and 422 projects, you know, kind of getting off the NFT thing. Is there anything kind of creatively that you have coming down the pipe as far as like solo stuff? Is it kind of your aspiration to continue with like these abstract synth pieces or, you know, at some, yeah. at some point, could there ever be even be like conceivably a Mike Dean, like producer type album where you're just like, you know, doing the beats, bring other artists on to kind of do whatever they want over them. Yeah, that's coming over the next year. I've been saying that for years, but I really want to get one done. Mm. I'm starting every time I work with an artist to try to get a song, pull a song with them, you know, and put it aside. That's, you know, do the Mike Dean um, 
2022. <laughs> you know, okay, whatever. I don't, you know, whatever. Um, reference to the chronic, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I could, I could definitely do a good album. You know, if I got everybody that I work with to get on the album, it'd be fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, and I'm definitely, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop a bonus for 422 in like a week or two. Mm-hmm. I'll try to drop on the 28th. My label doesn't even know yet. I'm, <laughs> I'm about to finish it. I've, I've got like 10 live streams that I haven't even touched the music on. You know, I, I'll probably take one of those and put out like 45 more minutes of music. Hmm. You know, and then the NFTs, um, me and Shepard are doing are going to be the first place is going to have original music. The second, third, and fourth place are all going to have an original song to go with the NFT. Is, are the rest of them going to have original? Those are going to have songs from the album, I think. There's going to be some music that only lives in NFTs, which is kind of, it's an experiment in itself, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that definitely is. Um, yeah. Well, listen, uh, we've taken up, I think, enough of your time and appreciate you coming through. And thanks for just being cool, being chill, and just having a great convo. You too, man. It was a great interview. Yeah. Give you a thumbs up. Thank you, thank you. Two, uh, two of them. Wow, that's that's a very generous rating. I appreciate it. Thumbs, thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen. We'll look forward to whatever you're dropping with and whoever you're working with into the future. And uh, thanks for taking the time. Sh- shout out the uh, uh, the Twitch while we're over here because you're, you're streaming on this platform as well from time to time too. Is is it the real Mike Dean on Twitch or? Uh, yeah, the real Mike Dean on Twitch. It's the real Mike Dean on all social media. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be, I'm just about to sign my partnership papers with Twitch. So I'm going to be on more. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm on that partner train too. Yeah. I'm back. <laughs> well, we need to yeah, get Gustavo to connect us on text. I need to ask you a few questions about that actually. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, <laughs> we'll, we'll do, we'll do that. Oh uh, Lord. Okay. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll do that then. We'll do that then. All right. Well, all right. Cool. All right. Thanks man. Thanks again for coming through. Bye. All right, bye.